Hey, golfers, and welcome to the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. And today we have a very, very special episode because it is Augusta week. It is the week of the Masters, and we have Brian Knutson joining us from Golf WRX, uh, their resident club junkie, uh, to kind of talk clubs in play at Augusta this week. So, uh, Brian, first of all, thank you for taking the time. Uh, I know it's busy in a lot of ways for you guys, but especially it's also just an exciting week in golf. And so uh, to take an hour with us here, um, I really appreciate that. Hey, well, I, I really appreciate you guys having me on. This is awesome. I'm super excited. For me, this is like the best sports week of the year. I've always loved the Masters. It's just one of those things that, uh, you know, out of all the majors, this is like my favorite. It's the first one. It's just there's so much about it that I love. And, of course, you know, as you said, uh, equipment is, I guess, my vice in life. Uh, if you ask my <laughs> wife, she probably uh, would look down here in this uh, basement that I'm in with this this studio that I have. And, uh, yeah, uh, clubs and uh, clubs and the Masters two things fit right together for me. So excited. Thank you for having right. me on. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, in terms of clubs and play at Augusta and obviously what you guys do at golf table X and, and um, you know, so in tune with sort of the clubs that are in play on tour. Right. So um, I guess I kind of wanted to just start and you kind of hinted at some of these things already uh, is just what is it about this week that makes it so special for not even just the players, the caddies, the spectators on site, but even just us as golf fans. What, like, could you kind of summarize what is so special about this week? I, I think for a lot of golfers, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, outside the professional ranks, whatever, I think for a lot of golfers, just as as fans, for us, this is kind of like the kickoff to the golf season in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it's springtime for us Northerners. You know, you, you and I, right. Drew, both are, are unfortunately in the North. We don't get to play all year. So, uh, you know, we have to shut it down or go indoors for, for the winter. And this a lot of times is that, that kickoff that says, hey, spring's kind of here. The golf season's really starting up, you know. And, uh, and and also, you know, then you look at the major and the tradition, the history of yeah. it, the, the players who have won it. Uh, and some of the the amazing things that we've seen, some of the weekends that we've seen in terms of the uh, the Sunday finishes on 18, the iconic holes. It's just there's so much tradition, so much kind of pageantry. And, you know, if you've ever been lucky enough to go, the grounds are just I mean, everything you see on TV, it's better than what you see. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just that great kickoff to the golf season that gets us all super excited to break the clubs out, watch some golf, get ready to play and, uh, and start up our, our golf year. Yeah, I think for me, it was always growing up. It felt like in you know middle school, high school, growing up, it, it felt like Masters Week was always the annual you know spring snowstorm where I would get a day off maybe from school yeah. because of the <laughs> snow. Uh, but you're right. I mean, all those things, right? It's it's the same course every year. It's such an there's such an elegance to Augusta National, um, and so there's yep. all these things kind of play into it. And then the time of year, of course, being sort of a, for us at least up in this region of the country, kind of a kickoff to the golf season. So um, obviously very exciting for for both of us and reason we're, we're so pumped for this. So um, let's kind of dive into some equipment now. So there's a few trends that we can kind of cover. I know we've both got a pretty good pulse on these things. Um, you know, and it's, again, it's one of those events of the year where we finally get all the best players in the world, right, together uh, to compete yeah. for, for a championship here. So... Um, one of the, one of the sort of trends I've identified or I've I kind of noticed is tailor made staffers go, not really choosing the LS model as much. I know Tiger Woods is playing the LS model, um, but you know Tommy Fleetwood, Rory McIlroy, Scotty Scheffler, uh, several others are going with kind of the standard model. Like the, the, I guess they're tailor made's kind of branding it as a QI10 core model. Um, is I guess from your perspective and what you know about these heads, you know what's the difference between them? Maybe why would some of these players be choosing the the core head versus the LS? Yeah, I think the, it, it all comes down to to launch conditions for all of us. You know, whether excuse me, we're in our fitting for our own driver or these guys, and you know, we always assume that these you know these players on tour, since they have such fast club head speeds, they hit the ball so far that they're generating tons and tons of spin. And a lot of these players don't, you know, they're very efficient with their swings. Uh, They hit up on the ball very well and they don't create a ton of spin. And right now the QI 10 LS is probably one of the lower spinning heads on the market when it comes to Mm -hmm. drivers this year. And for a lot of players, I think, yeah, they initially jumped into the LS and and found some success and then realized, you know, as they're testing and as they're playing probably progressed and 
playing under pressure in tournament situations, probably realized, you know, maybe I could use a little bit more spin, maybe a touch more launch, depending on, on how they set those things up. And, you know, and then you, if you, if that launch condition is right, and you throw in a little bit of added forgiveness for, you know, that high pressure tee shot that maybe you don't hit it just perfect. You get that a little bit added stability with the QI 10. So I think it comes down to a little bit to just, you know, uh, adding some spin to these drives uh, in order to kind of gain a little more distance, a little more control for, for these players. Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly there's an element of the forgiveness that you want. And, you know, the drivers today are, are kind of insane in that department, right? There's so much forgiveness, so much MOI on the miss hits. Um, now, granted, at this level of golfer we're talking about, those miss hits are uh, few and far between. But, you know, like you yeah. mentioned, you know, maybe you're on the 18th hole at Augusta and you really need to hit a fairway. Um, there, it, that narrow kind of shoot that you have to hit through uh, looks a lot smaller when you're in under that pressure. And so there's that element of forgiveness that maybe they're looking for. And, and to your point too, I think, I think you're right about that. That sort of perception of spin is you see these players with, you know, 120 plus club speed sometimes. And the first thought is that they it will produce a ton of spin, but I know Rory McIlroy is relatively a low spin player. Um, and just the way that kind of hits yep. that high draw that sort of knuckles through the air. And so, uh, yeah, I guess it, it sort of, we're kind of trying to buck trends here that maybe golfers think or maybe, you know, the, the avid player uh, might see in, in on tour is that the LS head is not just for tour players. And in fact, it might even be for a lot of amateur players, because as you mentioned, there are a lot of amateur players that generate a ton of spin too. Yeah. And I, and I think amateur players, you know, probably generate in certain situations, even more spin, especially because nowadays this game has caught, kind of gone a slightly different direction. You know, the, the game has so many more younger players, coming into it mm -hmm. that are extremely athletic, you know, played other sports, uh, you know, throughout their, their young lives and they get into golf and they bring that athleticism over to this game. And, but they may not have the best mechanics, you know, they may not be hitting up on it as much as they should. They may be hitting, you know, a little bit more neutral in terms of angle of attack, or even hitting down on the ball a little bit, uh, which are things that generate more spin or they hit more of a, a fade or slice type shot, which produce more spin. So I think the LS still has a, a great home. I think it's still got a lot of players who can use it uh, for what it is being as low spin and, and kind of flatter launching head. It isn't crazy unforgiving. You know, the, the QI 10, right. the, you know, the cores we've kind of been jokingly referring it to uh, it is definitely more forgiving, but I think the LS still definitely has a place for the right golfer. And, you know, when you go into a fitting and, and you know, if it goes that route where your fitter hands you uh, an LS model, I don't think you should be scared of it because they're handing it to you for a reason and they think it's going to work or there's something about it that, uh, you know, is going to kind of mesh with your swing. So the LS, I think, is still a great driver. It's just going to take, you know, the right player to maximize the performance out of it. Yeah, I also think there, like, it, it takes me back to Callaway in the last maybe three, four years, you know, back with the, um, the Epic series, the Rogue ST series, where they had the Max LS model. And I'm kind yeah. of wondering if something like that is going to be brought back, not necessarily by Callaway, maybe something um, in a driver series in the future here. That's something that is kind of, you know, marketed in a way where it's low spinning and forgiving. They kind of don't really have a um, sort of that mix out there right now. So, uh, but anyway, I just thought that was interesting because there's, it seems like m more big names today are playing a quote unquote more forgiving driver than sort of the low spin models um, and Taylor made specifically those guys kind of um, caught my eye. So I, it's something I'm watching. Um, let me see how things change yep. here in the coming weeks. And, and obviously maybe how these guys hit the ball this week as well. Um, yeah. And, I'm, and I'm, interesting. I'm, I'm going to for sure. I definitely me too. And, and, and I'll throw one little point. So a lot of guys on tour and I don't know if this, I mean, who may be interested. So the, there is a head from Taylor made a QI 10 that is called the dot head. And mm. what it is, and you can't really tell a lot of difference, but if you look at where the, the loft is on the hosel, and it'll say, you know, 9.0 with a little dot to the upper right, right by the zero. So it looks kind of like nine degrees, you know, a little dot. And they're actually called dot heads. They're tour only at the moment. And the rumor, no, you know, Taylor May doesn't specify. The rumor is that it is a spin model in between. It basically has the forgiveness of QI 10 mm. and it has a little bit lower spin, okay. not quite as low as LS. So it kind of does fit in the middle. Unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to get this at retail. I don't think it's something that you know a lot yeah. of us uh, are, are going to get our hands on. But the you know the the heads that like Rory and Scotty and a couple of those guys are playing are these dot heads that uh, I think, like you mentioned, kind of have that little combination of slightly lower spin, 
okay. still have you know the, the the same look, some of that forgiveness. Uh, so they they may exist out there, and maybe you know going forward, maybe we will see something like that at the retail level. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That 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 kind of adds some pretty good context to this whole thing. So I've been fascinated by the whole the whole conversation and and um and you know the 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 I guess gravitation away from LS, but that does tell a little bit of the story yeah. as well. So uh, yeah, fascinating. If there is a limited edition, maybe again like a tour only thing that you know maybe we'll get a few traded in here at Second Swing. Who knows? Um, so <laughs> that's right. You just got to look at that hosel or you know, that hosel loft. Area. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> and so another trend I've noticed and I'm kind of switching complete opposite end of the bag here, um, is is on the greens, the flat stick, uh, specifically players going to mallets um, instead of blades. And I think if you were to look at the putters that, say, the top you know, 10, top 20 players were using, say, a decade or, or, or more, more ago, a majority of them would have been sort of the blades or the you know smaller club heads, answer styles, uh, things like that. Now it seems like it's flipped where – most players, it seems like, are using a mallet, and you, it's rare that you actually see a, a, a blade style. So I'm kind of curious your perspective on that. You know, is is there maybe an awakening happening happening where players are seeing the benefits of the forgiveness of a mallet, or I guess maybe where do you what do you attribute this trend to? I I think you're right. I think there's something there where there are players who are now kind of getting into the fact that there is something to a blade putter. You know, before I think, you know, especially when I first got into to working at a shop, I kind of thought a blade and a mallet, a lot of it was just looks, you know, do you yeah. like to look at the bigger mallet? Do you like, you know, the alignment features maybe that are there, but I think a lot of pros are even starting to realize that, you know, I mean, as much as we don't, you know, don't want to believe it, they do miss the center every once in a while on a putt yeah. and having a blade or a mallet putter with a little higher MOI, a little bit more stability kind of push back uh, is, is helpful and it, and it can keep those putts online a little better much like it does for you and I uh, out there. But also I think the, the second part of that is with blades. Now we're seeing all the hosel options uh, from the blades that we had flow next, mm-hmm. slant next, plumbers next. Those are all making it into to mallets now. So if you don't, you know, mallets were always for a long time face balanced. And now if you don't want face balanced, you have that option in a mallet to have a little slant neck and have some toe hang. So, you know, if you've got a little bit of arc in your stroke, you can kind of feel that that toe kind of shut and get squared impact. And those things didn't really exist. I mean, in the early 2000s, I felt like it was double bend face balance or it was, yep. you know, you went to a blade and those are your choices. And I think having a lot of options and having that kind of blade feel with the mallet stability, that combination has just been an absolute killer for on tour where I get a little, you know, I get the best of both worlds uh, in a putter out there. Yep. And I mean, an example of that right now is, is Scotty Scheffler. Um, so he's been playing that yep. sort of, that I believe it was a, as a Scotty Cameron, um, like a Newport, either the standard Newport or Newport two for the longest time, um, and then he, you know, went Taylor went to Taylor Maywood and asking for this the Spider Tour build with kind of that that L neck sort of hosel where that's typically you know it's going to have some toe hang, typically reserved for kind of a blade style putter. Or in the past, most of those designs are with a blade style, and you know he tried it way back in the fall, I think, messed around with it, didn't give it maybe as fair of a chance and then he returned to it this spring and the winning streak started uh so he went one one and first first and then i think he runner up right so there's yep. maybe something there at least for scotty he would definitely probably endorse this this trend here and i think you know a lot of players have i mean you look at you know rory i mean heck even remember when tiger when he first went over to taylor made put that what was it the armor three or something i do like remember that, that in the yeah. back he had a yeah, yeah run I mean, at the he PGA with that a thing. while I know the red one. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think there, there's something to it. I think, you know, when you get into a little bit of a putting funk or you feel like you're not putting as well as you should, there's always, Hey, let's try something new. And uh, I think once you you know decide to, Hey, let, let's try the mallet, let's really give it a, a shot. You can probably find that you're not losing a ton of, per, you know, I think the blade, a lot of feel sound mm-hmm. and look, you don't lose a lot of that with the mallet. Okay. The look is different. All right. But I think the sound, the feel, that toe hang, the feel uh, as those pros kind of manipulate it through their the stroke is that that uh, head come kind of comes back into impact. All those feels can come back with a, a mallet now. It's just a matter of finding the right one. So, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely interesting. And it's also interesting that the different amount of styles. Spider was huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, especially the Spider Proto. Like you mentioned with Scotty, when he first put it in, they had that Proto with the milled face. The, the CG was pushed forward. The weights were pushed forward. 
Uh, I know they just released those again. I think they sold out of them, just re-released them. It had the milled face. So, you know, the options for, for mallets now is just wild. I mean, you can get anything you want from a milled face to an insert to, yep. you know, whatever type of alignment on top. So, uh, you know, you, you go down, decide to go down that road, there's a good chance you're going to find something that you like the look of, the feel of, the sound of, and you putt well with it. Yeah, there's just, there's so many options you get. You can have whatever you know, amount of toe hang that you are looking for for your putting stroke, uh, but you yeah. can get it with a mallet and with sort of the benefits of that weight back, a little more stability. Um, and so I think I think we're also starting to see that movement with amateurs too. I know I haven't played a blade since I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old, nine years old. I mean, I've been playing a mallet forever and I, I will always recommend to, you know, my friends that are looking for a new putter to try out at least a mallet, see if that look is not scaring you away and if it doesn't it's yep. probably going to be a benefit for you uh because you know as we as we've said amateur i mean pros are going to miss hit the center of the face with a putter amateurs are going to do it way more often than that so for sure yeah and uh no i mean i i'm it's funny because i was kind of the opposite i played a mallet forever went to a blade the past two years and now i'm back to a mallet this year for right mm. now so yeah it's uh, it's just a, a roller coaster yeah, I mean it's again putting is you know as as our a couple of our fitters here like to say putting is forty percent of your game, roughly, and so that's if yeah. you're gonna get any part of it dialed in and make sure it's absolutely right for you, that's probably the one to start with and then go from there. So, um, kind of staying with putters, then I wanted to talk a little bit about another trend on the greens that we're seeing on tour, and you're gonna see a lot at Augusta. Um, is not only are players gravitating towards uh, mallets, probably that's more heavier and more pronounced now, but another one starting to emerge is longer length putters. So uh, you've seen, I mean, we just saw it, the Valero um, Akshay Batia one with sort of that broomstick style putter. Um, we've seen a lot of players gravitate towards also the kind of longer counterbalance style, maybe in that 36 to 38, 39 inches range. Um, there's something about that build as well that it seems to be very popular. Players are gravitating towards it. You know, Wyndham Clark put it in last year and won two really big events, including the U.S. Open with that style. So, you know, what what do you know? And I guess what are you seeing is is such the big benefit that maybe tour players are, are seeing from going to a build that's a little bit longer? I, I think with anything, it's, it's you know, you're searching for something and, and a lot of players, you know, especially with putting, uh, you're searching for consistency. And, you know, with those, you know, counterbalanced or even longer builds, uh, there's something about consistency. Now, they take a little bit of work. You know, I've, I've messed with some counterbalance. I haven't really messed with the, you know, as we as we call them, the broomsticks, the the really long yeah. putters like uh, like Akshay was using and Adam Scott uses. But, uh, you know, I've messed around with the counterbalance putters and the slightly longer builds like that. And I, I tell you what, there's something to be said where there's some stability in there that if you're someone who has maybe, a, you know, an inconsistent stroke, whether it's, you know, the actual path of the putter head, whether it's something where, you know, your hands are manipulating the putter head in some way through the stroke, that little bit of extra weight, that counterbalance, that weight kind of uh, up in the hands more. It, it does do something. I mean, there's a different feel there. And, you know, while I can't say, yes, run out and grab one, go buy one, you're going to make a thousand putts, it, it, there is something to it. And I think for, for players who are looking for, you know, just extra stability, a way to kind of calm down the putting stroke, uh, it, it's a great way to try it. And these, you know, counterbalance builds, like you mentioned with like Wyndham Clark and Ricky was using one, you know, especially mm -hmm. with the dead Jailbird 380. Uh, you know, yeah, th there's something there. And, and the first thing you'll notice, uh, you take one out to the putting green, short putts just feel like they're very easy to make. Yeah. Uh, now, now you do have to practice, I feel, a little bit with the, the longer putts and all that to get kind of the feel down for for lagging it close. Uh, but, you know, to, to calm that, that putting stroke down to, to help you get more consistent, I, I think that's the big advantage to these longer putters, whether it's broomstick or kind of a counterbalance build to it. Yeah, there's certainly an element. I think that you pointed out something that I, I I have sort of been asking people on this topic. You know, our fitters, or you know, we uh, we did a live interview uh, on our YouTube a few weeks ago with um, Sam Han, CEO of Lab Golf, and so I kind of oh, yeah. get his perspective on this as well. Um, but about the mm -hmm. sort of the you know distance control on longer putts with longer putters, and sort of back in the day, right when it was whether it was a belly putter or maybe it was an anchored broomstick style where you could really anchor it to your body it almost felt like when you anchored it you took away some of that feel on the on the long putts but uh, 
it seems like now the 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 feel and sort of the kind of just letting the putter do the work. It's more about just how far do I take the putter back, and then the momentum of the extra added weight there kind of carries it through, and you're not as guessing as much on those long putts, I guess. So it seems like there's benefits on both sides, the short putts and then the long putts too. It's just obviously it takes a lot of that practice of getting used to, but it's the stability is, is incredible. As somebody who is putting a, a AI1 Cruiser Jailbird in the bag this year, I probably should add that for context as well. <laughs> yeah, just let's just be transparent about what's going yeah, in the bag right, yeah. right yeah. Uh, no and, and and sam's sam's an awesome guy and yeah uh, very smart guy as well and yeah it, it's you know the counterbalance i was messing around with it after kind of windham and ricky and those guys you know kind of won uh you know that jailbird 380 wasn't easy to get your hands on so i i had a, a putter head here that was kind of bigger heavier added some weight to it i put the heavier shaft in it just like kind of they built it and, and it's interesting because they're built a little differently i feel like when the first counterbalance putters came out it was you took a you know really heavy 400 gram head you slapped a big brass weight in the uh, handle section of the shaft and mm -hmm. you just went out and putted and it and it was it was fine it worked pretty well but now i think as they've, they these manufacturers have done more research and, and done more of these builds they found that you know going with yes a heavier head say 380 grams 390 and then putting a heavier shaft in it and then just a little heavier grip you could kind of spreading out some of that weight and it just has a little better feel to it than the old ones did. I felt the old ones were fine, but these just flow a little bit better through, you know, as you use them and without putting the big brass weight in the heat, you know, in the, in the handle section, you just have a heavier grip, a taller grip, a little heavier shaft mm -hmm. and, and the builds are a little different, you know? So if you had one years ago and you maybe didn't like it, you know, some of the new ones, I think, you know, they're built differently and, and you may like the feel of them a little more, but, but you're right. I mean, that old saying that I think, are, you know, anybody who taught you golf was probably, you know, let the club do the work that goes with, you know, with these counterbalance and long uh, broomstick style putters, because it is just let the club do the work. All you have to do is kind of guide it, pull the, the club head back, you know, figure out how far back you need to go for however long, putt you, however long of a putt you have and just go with it. And if you can do that, I think you really can, you know, take advantage of these putter builds. Yeah, I know in talking with um, our fitter, Larry Bobka here, who, you know, is a guru when it comes to putters, he had, he, he says his kind of yeah. where he thinks amateurs especially might have putting issues is that they, you know, accelerate too quickly through the putting stroke. Maybe they take the club back too short and then they accelerate too quickly. And then and the reason why he is seeing so much success with these longer builds and putter fittings is just that it's almost it's tougher to f make that mistake in the putting stroke and over accelerate yep. because the putter's heavier it's tougher to kind of get out of rhythm so to speak there so um you're definitely going to see a lot of players at augusta using a different style like this i mean off the top of my head victor hovland uses one and then we went through all the players that are using the jailbird Wyndham clark ricky fowler um keegan bradley's using one um yep. and then you know of course we can talk about the broomstick as well will zalatoris adam scott Lucas Glover's in one, um, Ben Ahn's in one. So there's there's a ton of players that are probably going to pop up on the leaderboard that you're going to see using a, I guess, longer than conventional length putter. So something to watch for sure. I, I'm, I'm curious, and uh, I, I wonder if this is a trend that's going to continue to snowball because um, it seems like it's got some pretty good momentum based on all the victories it's had, you know, from last year and, and up in, as recently as uh, at the Texas Open. Yeah, I, I I think it definitely will jump up for a little while. I feel like like putting is a very it, it's a big circle, and there's a lot of trends, and yeah, we, we right kind of jump that. on them. I mean, remember when everybody had to have a heel shafted mallet, as Odyssey called it, the number nine, or uh, mm -hmm. you know the Delmar uh, from Scotty Cameron, and that was like the big trend. Everybody had heel shafted ma uh, blades. That was a big thing. Now hardly anyone uses one. You barely see one on tour. I think like Sergio right. may have one in the bag at the moment, like an old Scotty. Um, and then we went, you know, we, then we got into counterbalance, as you mentioned before the belly putter, I had a belly putter oh, yeah. that I love for a little while. And then that went away. And then we, you know, kind of went, so I, I think there's definitely trends. And I think for the next few years, the longer bill, the broomstick, the counterbalance putter are going to be kind of big. The only thing with it is, I think at that level, people always want to try new things, but there also is a limit to how new people will try in the golf world. And I think for the hardcore golfer, Hey, if I'm struggling, grab me a, you know, grab me a new putter, whether it's broomstick, whether it's counterbalance, let's try it. I think for a lot of average golfers, they may not go that route just because of it may be a little too different, 
and the yeah. amount of practice time they they may have available may not work. The other thing too, other thing too is how many fitters are familiar with those setups and, and how they really work and how they should be fit. And if you don't have access to that in your area as well, it may be also a little mm-hmm. harder to get that into your bag. So I think there'll definitely be a big rise. I just don't know if it'll be something that is sustained. You know, ten years, twenty years down the road, we look at it and say, "Wow, everybody's using you know this style putter now." Uh, I think eventually it, it'll die down a little bit and go back to a little bit normal, uh, and 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 continue to kind of ride that circle yeah. of putter trends. Yeah, it's isn't it fascinating how we look back and and you know, like fifteen years ago, nobody would have guessed this is happening, and and you say the same thing probably no. fifteen years before that. You know, uh, it's it's wild how some of these trends emerge and and then go away and some stick around you know like uh i mean the answer style has been iconic in in golf forever and i'm sure at first conception it was never there was never an inkling that it would be this much of a staple so you know i i'm i'm just i'm curious to watch it it's just fascinating how quickly that sort of trend has seemingly i don't want to say taken over it's not like everybody's playing it but there's a large contingent of players uh on tour that have some influence that are that are doing it so I will be watching it for sure. Yeah, definitely. I will too. And then, you know, like you mentioned, the longer putters, like, you know, you mentioned Sam uh, and, and lab putters and, you know, Axis One. And there's a couple of these putters that have this kind of uh, torque balance to them where the face stays square when you just yeah. kind of set it. You know, remember Callaway messed with that with the backstrike putters and the toe up putters. And, you know, those things have come around before and they didn't stick, but now we're seeing you know, lab putters are very big on tour. Justin Rose playing an Axis one. Are we going to see maybe the big manufacturers get back into doing yeah. putters similar to that again? You know, that that's going to be interesting to see in the next year or two as well, because we're seeing, as you mentioned, a big trend on tour of, of, of players using those style putters as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, it's all, it's all interesting. I mean, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's crazy how much influence these tour players have, you know, when they win a couple of events with a certain style. Uh, I mean, the jailbird, revitalization you know if there's a couple of wins last year and now it's not only getting momentum on tour but you know you see it in the stores as well so um it's it's kind of fascinating and i'm I'm excited about it personally because i have one in the bag too so um now (laughs) i kind of wanted to just get some just kind of ask you right i mean this is we've talked about some of those trends that are emerging and some of the things we've noticed um just wanted to ask if, you know, in terms of what we know about pl- the clubs players are playing, specifically kind of these maybe novelty or unique ones that are out there, uh, do you have any in mind, you know, a player is playing a particular club that you really like? Um, I'm going to give you one that I have off the bat. I like that Patrick Cantlay is playing some old clubs. Um, so he's got yeah. like a 915F three wood. He's got AP2 irons, which are, you know, at least, what, six years old now, even maybe more than that. So... Um, like that right there to me is kind of cool. And then being here at second swing and sort of being the, you know, I, I, we sell a bunch of used clubs, right? Like you get a ton of those options used. So you got a couple out there in mind that you're, that kind of popped to your head when you think of maybe your favorite clubs in play this week. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was interesting. I remember when, uh, yeah, Patrick Cantley playing the older 915 stuff. I mean, when 915 came out, I mean, what a, I mean, that, that wood line was just revolutionary oh, yeah. for Titleist. It was so cool. Uh, yeah, kind of interesting. A couple that I w- went and looked at, and uh, the first one I'm going to go with is what's Colin Morikawa going to play? Uh, beginning of the year, he had QI-10, uh, the yeah. standard model, the core model in the bag, uh, with a Diamata GT60 TX. And then last week at the Valero, he's back to the TaylorMade Sim, the original Sim, not the Sim yeah. 2, not the whatever, the original Sim. Uh, and he had that with that Diamante D plus limited 60 TX, which one's he going to go with? Uh, I haven't seen yet. I was watching some masters on the range this morning. Uh, they didn't show him yet at least, but you know, pretty interesting that he is still playing and that SIM driver was phenomenal. Don't get me yeah. wrong. That, oh, yeah. that SIM was so good. I had the max version. I hit it great when that thing was out. Uh, but yeah, Colin just can't kind of get away from it. And I know it's a low spin head. Uh, it, it's, it's really looks good. But yeah, which one's he going to put in the bag? Because he's messed with a little bit of both this week, and you know that sim is just a classic old driver. One of those, like you said, you you probably get you guys probably see it there come in traded in. Oh yeah, and you know remember the days of playing it. But uh, it'll be interesting to see does he play that? You know wh- wh- which model? Which model is the new one or the right. old one go in the bag? Because I think if my guess, he's going to go with old faithful and go with the sim personally. Yeah, I mean he's that's he hit the most probably the most iconic shot of his career for sure um, yeah. at the PGA back in 2020 with that one. And so 
Uh, yep. Yeah, it seems like he has been toying with even over the years too. Maybe it, you know, maybe one event here or there, or one kind of practice round here or there with Stealth or Stealth Two or whatever it was. But he always goes back to that sim, and I, I think there's something there with you know we talk about players swapping equipment or trying something new, but there's a familiarity that they have with a certain build or a certain setup that um, for a lot of these players it's really tough to to get out of their hands. So that's definitely one example. Yep. Um, yeah, if, if you want me to go, I'll go again. I'll go, uh, and again, we're going to kind of go stick with driver and go old school again. But how about, uh, I, I know it's, we haven't seen as much of him cause he's over on live now. Uh, but Patrick Reed with still with the, the G four the G 400 LST really? with the auto. Yeah. With the auto, the rogue one twenty five MSI, the auto, the rogue silver one twenty five MSI tour issue shaft, uh, that he so famously, I think won the masters with, uh, yeah. when he had it, his was missing a weight in the soul. And the weight is back, at least from the images that I've seen lately. Uh, but yeah, he's had that in the bag for the past few tournaments out on Live Tour. He had it down in Miami. Uh, but again, kind of an, an older driver that's an absolute cult classic. Uh, I mean, anybody who, who owned a G400, whether the Max, the LST, they mm-hmm. know how good those drivers are. And then that shaft, that that Rogue Silver, the 120. So the, the retail one was a 110 MSI. The, the Tour issue one with a 125. They look very similar from a distance. And uh, that thing was one of those shafts that everybody played on tour and then everybody wanted uh, in the amateur ranks. But again, you're, you're talking ping G 400, you're going to get stability. The LST model is going to be a little bit lower spinning. Uh, he famously worked that thing around Augusta uh, when he won his green jacket. So uh, pretty cool to see him still playing something, uh, you know, like an older kind of classic cult classic driver head uh, still playing it today. Yeah. I think the G 400 series certainly still, uh, we look back at both, you know, I talk to the fitters and they say G400 is a go-to when someone's looking for a, you know, a used driver, not trying to break the bank, but something that still performs yep. really well, so something that they can rely on. The G400 series is, is certainly that one. And I, I think, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, I'm pretty sure Harris English up until maybe G430 was also playing G400 um, yeah. as well. And there's maybe a few, you know, tour pros out there as well that, you know, the G400 lasted in bags for a long time, so... Not surprised to see uh, someone playing it. I just didn't know Reed was still playing it. Uh, but I guess if you win a green yeah. jacket with it, why would you? Why would you uh, change it out, right? So <laughs> that's um, right. That's right. I got so. I, I got a couple here that I'll I'll outline as well for you um, that I just thought of, and one is going to be like the most basic um, answer. It's the it's Tiger's Newport too, um, and you know yep. that's like that's like a classic. Like everybody's going to love that one, but it's. It's the most accomplished golf club maybe ever um, in in the sport, and the fact that he sticks with it, you know, you you see the, the close up images that I know you guys are are capturing and posting on on Golf Tour X. There's nicks and dents and things everywhere, but oh. um, Tiger doesn't seem to care. He just he sticks with it, and I don't think you could pry that thing out of his hands. He, as we mentioned, he has tried a couple other things. I think he, way back he tried maybe a method putter in the you know. 2012, 13, 14 uh, era. And then he also tried that Ardmore from TaylorMade. Uh, but, you know, old faithful goes back in the bag. Yeah, he, yeah, he has. He's messed with a few different putters, but he's always kind of uh, either stuck with that Newport 2 kind of look mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, like I said, threw a blade in for a short time. But it, it is. It, it's that iconic club that, you know, long, long years and, you know, whatever decades from now and when tiger is uh you know unfortunately no longer with us i mean that thing will be hung in a museum somewhere and it will be you know just the, the history of it will just live on for forever yeah uh, but yeah it is beat up the the paint fill has fallen out of it the little cherry bomb in the you know on the front yep. uh, uh heel is gone or half gone uh it is ding dick to crap but again it, to him it's a tool it, it is a tool to win cl- win tournaments win majors and if it has a few dings that that's just what it is. So uh, it, it is definitely one of the uh, kind of the iconic clubs or the most iconic club in the sport. I'm going to still throw out a very, I, I think it won't be as well received. I'm still a bigger fan of his original Newport Terillium that he won in 97 with personally, mm, but that's yeah. just, <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that is an iconic one in itself. And you know, the, the Terillium yeah. putters, I feel like they haven't gotten, they still get, them some love and there's still a ton of value in them obviously if you were to like you know kind of go to the collector's market and you're going to see pl- a lot of people still love the to collect those trilliums but i'm i'm those are those are fascinating i mean i it, there was a limited run i feel like they yeah. kind of brought back a, a limited run a few years ago um scotty cameron did but 
you had I think Brooks played a, a Trillium model not long ago, uh, or yep, with maybe does. a Trillium insert. Uh, okay, he still does. So yep. yeah, there's a there's a lot there's a lot of history there too because. You go back to some of the Scotty's classics, and there's a there's some Trillium ones, and obviously you go back even further, and uh, it's fascinating to see how those have still stayed. And Tiger's playing one from you know way back then. So, um, yeah, one one uh, I'm also gonna throw out this one, and this is another one that maybe is basic, and, and to some sense it's got a lot of publicity, but I still love that it's maybe the only Nike club in the field this week, right? Um, I'm trying to think Ooh. of any others. I know there's a couple other putters or maybe a three wood or something still like on the PGA tour, but I don't think they're in the field this week. So it's the Nike Vaporfly Pro three iron that is in the bag for Tony Finau and I believe still Brooks Kepka. Um, and they, I mean, they have sworn by it when they've been asked about it. They launch rockets with it that it's a go to club for off the tee and they can obviously use it to attack, say, a long par five. Um, it's, yeah, I, I, you don't see many Nike golf clubs anymore, and this is still the one that's out there. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, most of the ones like you mentioned, there, there's been, you know, a few three woods lingering around on tours and things like that. But unfortunately, as as old as they're getting now, I think what the last production model was 2016. Yeah. Um, you know, those faces wear out, especially the amount of, you know, uh, balls that, that these guys on tour hit and faces crack and things wear out. And, you know, they unfortunately don't have replacements any longer. But yeah, these that Vaporfly Pro 3 iron for both those guys, Finaus and Kepka, it, it is unbelievable that nothing, you know, has has knocked those out. You think with, you know, ping and the I crossover, it's a great utility iron. You look at Srixon yeah. and, you know, the the ZX for for Brooks, a great utility. And these guys are just comfortable. And and there's something about them because I remember hitting the Vaporfly Pro irons. I never hit the 3 iron because that's just not my game. And and they're good irons. They were good, they were fine, whatever, but I don't remember anything about them just like blowing me out of the water like wow that's amazing it does these things and you know to these guys i I don't know if it's a comfort thing or they haven't found something that that produces the same kind of launch window or launch conditions that 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 this you know vapor vapor fly pro does but yeah they're they're just not leaving and and maybe it is it's just a comfort thing that they know you know standing on the tee box or standing at that whatever yardage out in the fairway they just know i'm gonna hit this shot with it and i can count on it i've counted on it for the past 10 years or not quite but you know the past how many years i've counted on it it's there when i need it and under pressure i know it's going to work and uh you know i guess there's comfort in that and it's it's probably won both mm-hmm. those guys a whole lot of money yeah uh, that's it's crazy that you know it i mean nike golf was was when i was growing up i mean i i wanted all things nike golf right oh, and i i wanted yeah. I, I, I mean tiger was playing it and then rory moved over um, and I wanted to deck my whole bag out in Nike Golf, and uh, so now, yep. now I'm still chasing that. I want to get that Vaporfly Pro now. I want that one, and I go online, <laughs> and I try and find one, and it's impossible. Or the ones that are available are, you know, a little bit out of my price range. So um, now, yeah. I have I got one more left. Do you have any more left that you um, that you kind of were eyeing this week? Yeah, I mean, I'll throw one one more. Uh, I'm going to go with Tommy Fleetwood. And mm. the TaylorMade Burner Mini Driver. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know they just re-released the new Mini Driver in kind of the new retro colorway, a little bit more copper on it. Uh, I, I personally think it looks really cool. I like it better than the old one. But uh, the the reason I like it like it is because, one, it's a Mini Driver, which is cool. It's a 13 and a half degree head. I think he's got it cranked down to 12. Uh, but he built it more like a driver. I know that these are, I think they're very versatile. You can build, you know, with a heavy shaft, make it more mm-hmm. like a three wood, real kind of shorter fairway finder. Or like Tommy, in his case, he's got a, a Ventus TR Blue 6X in it. So a 60 gram shaft, uh, plays it a little bit longer. Like I said, plays it down to 12 degrees. And it's just an interesting spot in the bag where, you know, I, you know, especially at Augusta where you've got a lot of tight holes, holes that you don't necessarily need to go full out with driver, but getting a lot of distance that when you can hit the fairway, like, you know, you think 13, um, yeah. you know, what is it? 11 or 11 is probably driver uh, because they moved that back, but you know, 13, there, there's a handful of holes. And then with, you know, two that moving that back, is that going to be a club that he now has to hit into the green at two? There's going to be some interesting spots where maybe that mini driver comes into play. And I like that he built his up like a driver. Cause a lot of people, I think, you know, automatically think I got to put a heavy shaft in it and make it like a three wood. No, he's making it like a mini driver, and it's kind of a cool piece. And I think it's it'll be pretty useful at Augusta. Yeah, I, it's it's surprising to me in a way that it doesn't seem like that has caught on tour as much as I maybe thought it would. Now, granted, I know it's kind of a niche product in the sense that it it only serves you for a certain purpose. You know, if you really need something that has basically a two wood, 
Um, and so many players are yep. used to playing a driver and a three wood. Right. And so in that sense, I understand it. Um, but it's, you're right. Totally. Like that's, that's a, that's a unique club that there's not many players out there using one. Um, uh, but I will be, I'll be tuning in. Cause I mean, you mentioned 13. I even thought of like, this might be a little bit off based on the yardages of where the bunkers are, but like hole three as well as a hole that he might not yeah. be able to, he probably can't get to with driver anyway. So maybe he opts for a little bit more control where he can lay up to that particular yardage for the wedge shot with that club. So, uh, there are certainly options out there, um, at Augusta for him to use that club. Um, That's a good call. You're right. I got one more that I'm going to throw out there, and I, I right. might need your help with sort of the exact name of it because I think I would be surprised if anybody's ever used a crank driver before at Augusta National. Yeah. And so I think Bryson's probably got to be the first one. I don't know the exact model name, but um, he that's one that um, I know he's probably – He's been trying different things since you know he split up with Cobra, and uh, I never, I guess, envisioned a crank driver being used by a high-profile player for a competitive events. But uh, here we go. Here we got one. <laughs> we we do definitely. And and, I, and the worst part is that I was watching uh, live from the range last night, and they showed Bryson hitting, and he was hitting two different. Ones. He had two different crank drivers. He hit one, and then the, you know whoever was with him handed him the other one, and he was hitting them both. And I meant to look it up because I was the same thing. I was like, I can't remember the name. I know there was like a crank formula or something, and I think yeah. he uses a different model. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, th the interesting thing is that crank, if you don't know, is they were originally for long drive. They made a lot of right. long drive heads specifically for those players, super low lofts. Uh, they do make uh, standard kind of drivers in like nines, ten and a halfs, things like that. So, uh, but, yeah, him using one there. I mean, we all know his his whole journey into this distance thing. And he was having custom drivers built by, you know, Cobra with that were seven degrees, five degrees, whatever they were. They were super low loft because of how hard he hits it, how high he hits it, all that. And I think kind of a transition to crank now looking back on it, it's probably pretty easy. I mean, they're a long drive company. That's what they specialized in. And for the type of club head speed, ball speeds he was producing, uh, they, they were probably very familiar with that game. Whereas mm -hmm. Cobra, you know, they they build stuff more traditionally. So uh, the crank stuff is 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 great quality stuff. I haven't hit it anything uh, lately from them, but uh, yeah, very interesting. Still playing. I think the uh, Project X, the original uh, Hazardous T eleven hundred, super super stiff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, gonna be interesting to see. He had that uh, was it a few years ago where he was just walking around Augusta playing amazing. And then on Sunday kind of fell apart. We all kind of thought that was his shot. But, yeah, the crank driver, definitely interesting. He's got a little different look to it. I think it's a little more edgy, not quite as round uh, look from mm -hmm. it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, definitely an interesting driver out there. Probably one of the most interesting uh, that will be out there this weekend. Yeah, I, I think you could probably go through Bryson's whole bag and it would be pretty eye-opening and, and unique from the rest. Yeah. I, know his, I know his iron lofts are very, very strong, and that's what he has said is due to, you know, the spin that he generates just with his swing speed. And so uh, – it's it's very different and very unique, but um, there's there's not just one way to play Augusta as we've seen before. So uh, yeah. that's that was kind of the theme of the theme of the the show today was sort of the different weapons that um, you're going to see players using at Augusta National this week. And you know, obviously, there's going to be one green jacket winner, but there's going to be you know thousands of different combinations of clubs and shafts in the bag this week. So um, Brian, thank you so much for joining today i wanted to give you a chance here where can where can the viewers and listeners um i guess get your content at golf wrx yeah so uh yeah thank you i mean one drew thank you for having me on i, I appreciate it this is awesome i always love talking gear so oh, yeah. it, it's just it's my passion uh but yeah no i've been uh, i've been with w, golf wrx this will be my eighth year uh come this fall so i've been there for a long time so golf uh I, I do a podcast there called the club junkie and uh yeah it's been great so hang out in the forums all that we do a lot of what's in the bag from tour we have uh, two guys who basically go to just about every tour event uh, unfortunately not the masters because this one's a little different when it comes to media right. but uh, <laughs> yeah. we're not there this week but most tournaments uh we are there getting photos what's in the bag photos and things like that so yeah golf for you know anything uh, equipment related that uh, you're looking to uh find or need or uh, especially the tour stuff awesome yeah i mean that is the go-to source for a what's in the bag you know after someone wins a tour event or lpga event uh oh, it's always up on guff wx right away so brian thank you for joining um and giving your insights on this it's going to be a fascinating tournament gonna to be a fun week and um, we hope all the viewers and listeners enjoy the tournament um thank you everybody for watching and listening uh, we'll see you next time